Hmm? Ah! Hmm. What we see in the space is that the podcast medium is becoming a more global um, phenomenon. More and more and more countries around the world are embracing podcasting. Podcast Junkies, episode one three nine. I'm getting excited as this is the run-up to podcast movement, which is why I decided to bring back a return guest. But in case you missed last week's, let's talk about that first. That was Nicole Aboud, host of Gen Y Lawyer. One of the best taglines was, dude, vote for Aboud, which is one she used when she was running for uh, office in school. I thought that was pretty funny. The whole conversation is great. It talks about uh, how she started her show Uh, how she kept going, and how she's able to actually turn it into a business. And it's interesting because everyone has got their own niche with these episodes, and they all talk to specific audiences. So I'm always interested when someone is actually able to take that passion and monetize it. So she's done a good job of that, and it was nice to catch up with her. Uh, We hadn't spoken in over a couple of years, I think. So please check that out, episode 138. So Rob Greenlee is my return guest. If you're an astute listener, you'll know that uh, he was here on episode 53. So you can check out that episode to get the full background of Rob's uh, entry into podcasting and why he's such a veteran in the space. He's got a lot of experience from his years in various positions, including at Microsoft, where he was in charge of the department that uh, ran the Zune. And if you don't know what a Zune is, then you'll have to listen to that. (laughs) It's a precursor or something that came out at the same time as uh, the iPod. Rob has got so much history in the space, and now he's over at Spreaker. And I thought it was interesting because the podcast movement is coming up, and there's been a lot of interesting things happening in the space. So I thought it was timely to have him on. And the full show notes for this episode are going to be at podcastjunkies.com slash 139. This episode is also brought to you by Podbean. Podbean is also going to be at Podcast Movement. So make sure you take a look for the Podbean table. And Jennifer Crawford is likely to be, I was going to say manning that table. And I wonder if that's weird to say when it's a woman at the table. (laughs) I'm probably overthinking it. But make sure you check them out. Uh, They've got great plans for starting podcasters. You can get started with an unlimited plan for as low as $9 per month. So be sure to uh, not only check out me, but also check out them at the Podcast Movement booth if you're going to be there. Sign up at podbean.com slash podcast junkies. And let me know if you did as well, as I'm still offering a half hour of free coaching to anyone who uses that link. If you're new to the show, this is the one show where we speak to engaging podcasters all across the podverse and just find out what makes them tick or what's going on in their lives and just try to have a casual conversation, sometimes candid, sometimes funny, sometimes uh, thought provoking. Make sure you stay till the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. Now let's get into it and talk all things podcasting on the podcast about podcasters with Rob Greenlee. All right, Rob Greenlee, welcome back for round two, Podcast Junkies. Oh, did you start? <laughs> I'm sorry. I did, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I wasn't sure what. Okay. I'm... I'm ready to go yeah. now, so go go, go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, round two of round two, Rob, thank you so much for joining us again on Podcast Junkies. Hey, it's great to be here, Harry. Thanks for having me back for the second time. I feel honored. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, regular listeners know that I really don't do it a lot. I think I can count on one hand the folks who've, who've come back. I think uh, Chris Cerrone came back, um, and then Chase Reeves came back for episode 100, and then, um, you know, we were, you know, chatting or, or, or connected and, and I thought maybe this would be a good chance to, for you to come back because as I was looking through, you were last on episode 53 and that was August. Uh, the publish date was August uh, 31st, 2015. So it's almost been two years. I know. It's amazing how uh, time is flying by on that. Yeah, I totally, I totally remember being on your show. It was one of those um, conversations that I, I really look forward to because I, I really enjoy your 
your personality and your uh, podcast. So it's it's a uh, you know the whole concept of podcast junkies is is just awesome because it fits r- r- right into my my view of the space. You know, I'm I'm a total podcast junkie. <laughs> it's do you find that you have to bid farewell to some like uh, like favorites? I, I I sometimes stare long and long longingly at my uh, podcatcher. I use Overcast. And every once in a while, there's shows that I just was used to listen to all the time to. And now, because of my business and because of you know what I'm doing with the show, I find that I have less and less time. And I have to be even more selective than I, w- that I was before. Yeah, I think we all go through these, these cycles where we um, you know, like different uh, podcasts and the topics and stuff. And we, it, it kind of fades from our interest over time. And I think that's a, that's a big reason why people kind of... Uh, phase in and out of shows a lot. I know I saw, I mean, over the many years I've been working in this space, you know, and I used to work on Zoom um, in the podcast area for, you know, for those that don't know what Zoom was, Zoom was a podcasting distribution platform for for Microsoft for many years. And I saw this like 50% churn on subscriptions. And I don't know if mm-hmm. this, this is something that happens in the Apple ecosystem that Apple just doesn't share that kind of data. But I saw it across, you know, a couple million podcast users, people would unsubscribe like to half of their, uh, their subscriptions every month, you know? So it, I, it, it was clearly a pretty significant pattern of people cycling through different podcasts and finding new ones and things like that. And that's why I think, uh, um, you know, it's such a, a you know, kind of, a, a space that's constantly evolving and changing because people are, are uh, changing what they listen to on a regular basis. What would be interesting would would uh, if would be if the folks at Edison I sort of went deeper with that part of it because it's it's really interesting and I think a lot of podcasters would benefit from understanding you know why is it that what was it that that caused people to lose interest um, and I think if there was some sort of survey done you know you listened for the first you know first five episodes but then you dropped off did did the show just get boring was there another shiny object i think things like that would be interesting for podcasters who are in this for the long run and are trying to build an audience that's going to stay with them year after year yeah i i, I really i thought about it a lot over the many years that you know i started to see that data come out of our platform and i i've thought a lot about it. i think it's very psychological i think it's very much uh, linked into how we our, our, our emotions at the moment and our thoughts of, uh, what are, what we want to listen to at the moment based on, you know, the, maybe the stresses in our lives or, um, what kind of a connection that we feel to the, the hosts or the guests or the, the actual topic itself. Cause sometimes topics are very, very kind of much top of mind for uh, a short period of time. I mean, especially a lot of podcasts that, that kind of vary in their topics a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes my particular focus on a topic comes and goes. So, you know, whether or not I, I connect to a podcast talking about, um, uh, technology and windows may be based on experience with windows at that time. Or, you know, if I'm following a comedy show, maybe I don't, I don't feel real like laughing or something like that. Maybe, mm. uh, I'm just not in the, the right mood to listen to that kind of content. And I think it's very much yeah. linked up into our, our, our very deep-rooted consciousness and psychology. Now you bring up a good point because I think the one thing that is consistent is the host. So if you establish a connection with your listeners over time, they almost come back for oh, it's almost almost like they come back for you and, and not so much the content. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. I think a lot of the connection that, that happens between – uh, listeners and a podcast is totally between the, the, uh, the host and the listener. And because I saw it a lot, I mean, I used to work at podcast one down in Los Angeles and I, I saw a lot of personalities kind of come through there, you know, the big name celebrity personalities. And then I just saw, you know, just like normal people come in and do podcasts and always the distinction that I saw was how personable they, they were and how easy they were to, to listen to in the headphones. Um, are, are, are they friendly? Are they, um, thinking about me? Do they give the impression that, that I matter to them as a listener? Uh, and those kind of little psychological cues are very, very important. I mean, if that person comes across as very egotistical and, and very kind of demanding and, and very, um, uh, rude and things like that, then I, I think a certain percentage of listeners will turn off from 
from listening. Um, and it's a very, it's kind of like what we do in the real world. I mean, as we meet new people, we evaluate them based on our experience with them and, and how they make us feel. And I think that's, that happens a lot with podcast hosts too. So, um, so that's a great segue. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the new media show with you and Todd Cochran has evolved, um, over the years, because, you know, you were doing it and it, it's, it's something that you consistently do. I'm a little behind and I'm wondering, this might be a good opportunity to, to get caught up on some of the topics. Um, a, uh, number one, the topics you guys have been talking about, but number two, if you've noticed anything in terms of your listenership, um, cause I imagine at this point you do have regular listeners who, who try to make it every, every single time, or at least listen to the, to the replay since you do it live. Yeah. I mean, the, the show itself has been really, um, I mean, since Todd and I have been doing a show together for so long now, uh, we have a certain kind of chemistry. I mean, I, I know him very well, uh, just based on doing, you know, I spend an hour and a half with him every week, um, talking about the, the podcasting space and, and I've been doing that for like five years now. So it's, it's, you kind of get used to somebody and you understand them at a pretty deep level. Uh, so, and this is also another factor that comes into podcasting, especially if you have co-hosts is that that chemistry between the two of you, um, is really important to the success and the longevity of that show. I mean, how well do you get along and how compatible do you think, um, are there kind of friction points between you that can make the show interesting? Um, and I think that's always existed between Todd and I, um, Todd has always been a very kind of like in your face, kind of tell you off kind of a personality at times. And I'm like the, the congenial one that wants to make everybody, you know, feel, <laughs> you know, feel good about each other. So, um, yeah. I've, I've been the one that's kind of smooths the water and he's the one that kind of likes tries to stir up the water, you know? So that's the, probably a good analogy. And so we kind of are kind of like have this symbiosis that, that happens, but I, I take a different approach to what I bring to the show. I bring the show kind of, uh, more of a outreach to the podcast community. And Todd is more about the nuts and bolts of the space and, you know, what's right and wrong and, and things like that. So you have this kind of this interesting blend between the two personalities and I think that's what makes that show work. And the actual size of the show has actually stayed pretty consistent. It's it's not like growing real fast. It's somewhere between eight and twelve thousand per episode. Uh, so it's a good. It's. I mean, I think it's a fantastic number for a show about podcasting. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. <laughs> honestly, um, but it's it, it's it's really a different format than I've really ever done too. Because um, there's no show prep that we do for that show. We just get up in the morning. Uh, Saturday mornings, pull the microphones in, you know, bring up Skype and Skype each other and just talk for an hour and a half. Th there's no show prep in that show at all. We just, mm -hmm. you know, get get in front of the microphones and start talking to each other. And um, that's just how, how, how it works. There's a little bit of prep sometimes that happens around me bringing in a guest or something like that. But um, we got feedback a couple of years ago. Uh, that they actually, uh, most of our listeners prefer the, just to be Todd and I, um, talking together versus bringing on a guest because it, it creates kind of like this, uh, third wheel that actually happens, um, that kind of detracts. Yeah, and and from, I think, yeah. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. I, I think, uh, you get this feeling that you have to keep engaging them and pulling them into the conversation so that, so they don't feel left out. Yeah, when it's not even as, as much that is that a lot of the listeners will tune in because they want to hear the, the interaction between Todd and I and not so much be have this disruption of a third person. Um and so we've we really kind of pulled back on having a lot of guests in there though though I still want to have guests on there. I mean because it adds a depth in the content that's that's um that's good because it adds a, you know, a little bit more context. Cause we tend to talk about a lot of other companies and a lot of other things going on in the space. And it's great to get that information directly from the, the horse's mouth, as they say. Um, and, and, but it doesn't happen very often anymore. And I'm not out there, you know, knocking on people's doors either, trying to get people on the show like mm -hmm. I used to. Yeah. I remember. So can you tell me some of the things that have been top of mind for you guys, uh, in, in recent episodes? Yeah, I think it's really the focus of many of the, the episodes that, that we talk about is um, the media coverage of the podcasting space and also about, um, you know, the this conflict that, that we feel between 
the the, um, the public radio side and the the more independent podcasters um, side of the fence, and how there, there's this increasing kind of divide between those two um, communities. And and that's a term that I like to refer to is that there there are two separate communities. Um, the public radio market is very much its own thing, you know, and it's always been its own thing. Uh, and the independent podcaster community has always been a much larger thing. Um, but there's this perception that public radio is more important than the independent side. And, um, and so I think, that, I mean, a lot of topics kind of stem from that. And then also topics around metrics uh, and what's happening with the IEB around um, coming up with standards and, and, and metrics. Todd has a very strong opinion about what's, what's happening on the metrics side. Um, and then just general trends around advertising um, and what's happening in that market. Uh, so th those are the, the topics that we typically focus on on that show. But they're, they're usually big picture topics. Um, mm -hmm. and we see a lot of mis misinformation in the, the media about the space. Uh, there's a lot of kind of spin that's out there that's not really accurate to the market itself. Uh, so there's a lot of talk like that. So we try and keep up with the latest every week about what's happening with the podcasting space. And, um, and I think we miss quite a bit of stuff that's going on. Um, but, but I think generally we try and um, cover it and give people some, some perspective, you know, like we spend a lot of time talking about this issue that happened with SoundCloud and, and what should be the, the reaction that people should have to what's yeah. happening to SoundCloud right now. And, and, um, and I think we have to walk a fine line, uh, both of us, because we both work for podcast hosting platforms. So we tend to, um, have a little bit of an agenda on that side and we're honest about that. Um, but, yeah. but it certainly is, is one that we've Todd and I have been through this, type of thing many times, you know, going back to Podango and going back to Odeo. And I mean, I can just go through a litany of platforms that have <laughs> got, gone away over the years that have caused, um, caused a lot of problems for podcasters because they, they weren't prepared for a company going out of business and taking their feeds down overnight, you know, that, that kind of stuff. It's interesting because, um, my background is a DJ. I, I he was DJing since high school. And when I first came across SoundCloud, it was a platform for DJs, for me at least, for DJs to upload their like 60 minute mixes. And I would just put my, every month I'd do a new one. And that's all I knew it for. And then as I started to get into podcasting and then people started to mention SoundCloud as an option, I just had this puzzled look on my face. I'm like, that's not what the platform was designed for. And it was funny that they were trying to even suggest that that's what it would be good for. So I think it's, it was. It just. It was. It was. It was meant. It wasn't meant to work out because I think they were just trying to expand beyond what their core competence competency was, and I, I think if they just had stayed in the space and tried to see different ways to monetize, um, like the music community, and and now it's just like so so different than when when I first signed up because now they're doing ads and it's just it, it's they really feel I really feel like they've lost their identity. Yeah, and and. I've talked to some of the staff over there over the many years I've been in the space and, and, um, I've definitely got the impression that podcasting to them was not a priority at all. Um, I mean, it was just something that they added to try and scrape up some more content, uh, for their platform to drive a little more traffic. Their interest is driving listenership and usership of their platform. They're, they're not a platform that really is focused on helping you get external distribution. Um, so, you know, just that alone, mm -hmm. um, makes you kind of like, um, think to yourself, you know, are these guys really looking out for the best interest of my program? Um, if, mm -hmm. if they're just trying to drive usership of, of their own platform and don't, don't really care about helping me succeed in iTunes and Stitcher and other listening platforms that, that are out there, um, because they're singularly focused on themselves. I uh, I think there's a conflict of interest there that um that any podcaster needs to to kind of think twice on. Yeah, I think any platform where podcasting is not their main thing um is one that uh, listeners should probably be wary of because at the end of the day they're not going to have our best interests at heart and I think 
so far it seems like there's you know the the four or five main players in the space and we just consistently see all you guys at the at the uh at the conferences now so <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's just been it's fun to watch like you guys are you know we're all it's a small community so we're all friendly with each other too and we all know each other too which which makes it even more interesting but i yep. think um I, I think at least with the core group it, it feels like um uh, everyone's on the same page and and everyone of that group you know the, the speakers the blueberries the lipsins the pod beans like they all have the the, the podcasters uh needs uh, at heart yeah, I think that's the that's been the focus uh, of all those companies, and I think you know um, the the leadership at all those companies is very focused on really, really defending the the rights of the independent podcaster because at at the core of all those companies, um, that's who the customers are for Lipson and mm-hmm. uh, Blueberry and, and Spreaker is the independent uh, content creator, the independent podcaster. Yeah. So of course we're going to be defending um those those content creators more so than the the big corporate podcasters or public radio or anything like that it's because those folks tend to kind of like put down independent creators and because they are competing against us and of course they're going to you know play the game that they want to play to compete against us so uh, e- even though the truth of the matter is is that the independent content creators are clearly the vast majority um, of content creators in this medium and uh, really made this medium what it is. Um, and so that's why, you know, Todd and Rob and I are, are such um, staunch supporters of the independent podcaster community is because it is the backbone of this medium and uh, will, yeah. will remain that for the foreseeable future. Can you talk a little bit about some of the conversations that you've been having at Spreaker? I know I've seen, I think it's your Facebook feed or your Instagram that you've traveled uh, to their headquarters a couple of times, which is, uh, must be nice for a change of scenery. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where the company sees podcast headed and how, if any, that's affecting the types of discussions you guys are having. Well, I mean... Spreaker, if we're speaking specifically about, about Spreaker, is um, yes. most of the, the team is based in Europe, um, but mm-hmm. there are two of us in the U.S. Um, I'm on, you know, I'm in Seattle, and then the CEO of the company is living in um, New York City. Um, so, okay. so we're that's new. We're somewhat, yeah, exactly. He was um, Francesco was uh, living in Venice. I know a tough, tough, tough gig, <laughs> but somebody has to do it. Yeah, a- um, yeah. I flew about about a year and a half ago. I flew in and uh, visited him in, in Venice and uh, saw his place there. And it's an amazing place to uh, to to work from. I have to say, um, but yeah. but uh, as far as the goals of the company, I think that the goals of the company and what we see in the space is that the podcast medium is becoming a more global um, phenomenon. More. Uh, and more and more countries around the world are embracing podcasting. Uh, we're seeing podcasting conferences popping up um, in Australia and oh, yeah. in, in Spain and Germany and all sorts of places. And and I think that the the uh, virus of, that was started in the U.S. is spreading. You know, the podcasting virus is what I like to call it sometimes. <laughs> um, is that it's because it is very much a you know spread by by people, you know, speaking to each other. It's a, it's a, it, as you know, Harry, it's a, it's a one-to-one um, medium really. Yes. And people uh, will recommend content to each other. Um, people will share uh, directly. And so we see that happening all over the world now, um, South America, uh, Australia, uh, Canada, the UK. I mean, it, all these markets are, are really doing doing phenomenally well with podcasting, and, and Spreaker is in the middle of that. We're a we're a global platform. Um, it's about sixty percent of the, the podcasts on our platform are 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 coming out of the U.S. So we still have about forty percent of our our market um, is uh, outside of the U.S. So that's uh, a lot. Yeah, I mean it's a uh, it's it's a lot of shows that are popping up, and they're not always in English. They're in all sorts of different languages, uh, you know, from all over the world. So um, that's what we see happening with podcasting right now is that uh, it's expanding beyond just the the U.S. market, 
though the U.S. market is hot right now. I mean, there's a lot of new shows yeah. popping up. Um, they're having to choose between you know some some uh, podcast hosting platforms, and there's more podcast hosting platforms popping up like every week. I mean, I keep, keep hearing. I don't know if you are too. I mean, I keep hearing about new ones popping up all the time. Um, and I've seen this happen before. I mean, back in the early days of podcasting, there was a lot of new companies coming into the space and I'm always a little worried about things growing too fast <laughs> and what the, the fallout from that might be in the long run. Well, it's, it's also, um, you know, we have to be spreading the news about what to watch out for in a way that doesn't look like we're trying to direct people towards a platform, but even just yeah. best practices like, Hey, try to go with someone who's focuses podcasting try to go with someone who's been doing this you know for four or five years or who've got people on the staff who know podcasting who who have been podcasting and i yeah. think when once they do that math then it narrows it down to about you know, the, you know the four or five companies we're talking about yeah that's true and ones that have had had some experience in the medium have some data sets too i know todd likes to talk about this a lot too todd cochran yeah Blueberry that um, that he has enough data now uh, after you know twelve years of running a podcast hosting platform um, that he can analyze things and come up with a better metrics you know uh, kind of analysis because he has a data set that takes back far enough in time to see patterns that come up from you know from bots online to people um, spamming his platform uh, you know there's there's websites out there that you can go to 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 buy downloads i hate to say it but hmm. um, those things exist out there and spreaker is constantly fighting against those um, spam bots that are out there and there's there's um, spam bots that are creating fake accounts in uh, hmm. some of these platforms and putting out um, they're putting out audio episodes but they're being auto generated um, and wow. it's it's really kind of a weird thing that's going on in, in the space, but I know that our our uh, kind of kind of programmers um, back in Europe are constantly having to go in and delete fake accounts that are being created by people, and and part of it's our own problem because we we give the opportunity for people to free accounts. Um, so I know a lot of the, the other podcasting um, hosting platforms don't allow free accounts anymore. Um, so. Uh, but we want to still offer that because we want people to come in and be able to try us out, um, you know, have a little trial run, you know, without having to commit to us. If they like what they experience, then the, they'll be they'll be more willing to upgrade to a paid paid account. Uh, and with that comes some challenges. Plus, we we also have listening apps too that people uh, would register for to listen on iOS and Android. Um, you know, our apps are comparable to a Stitcher as far as content and features and functions. Um, I yeah. think the big difference, you know, w with us is we support live streaming too. So you can come in and create a live program that becomes a podcast, but our, our apps allow you to listen to live content too. Do you, have you seen an increase in people who have an interest in going live? I know you, um, and Paul Colgan had a discussion about this on his podcast recently. Yeah. And at the end, at the end of the day, you know, it can it'll always be recorded and it could be available. Uh, it and it is available through the regular iTunes store. But yeah, um, I think there's there's some aspect of people still being attracted to this idea of being live and having a live audience. And I'm wondering what the what you've seen recently in that space. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been this this bubbling around live for, for a couple, you know, for many years now, you know, back in the, um, you know, you look at what's happening with Facebook and, and YouTube and, and, you know, some of these other, um, uh, live platforms that have come up on, on mobile and people like live. I mean, it's, it's not going to aggregate huge audiences and I'm not sure that anybody really expects that it's going to aggregate huge audiences, but what it does allow people to do is connect, um, and to, to share feedback into uh, programs and hosts and things like that, it, it it creates a deeper personal connection with a certain you know percentage of your audience, which is usually a tiny percentage. Like like on our new media show that we do every Saturday, we do that live um, on Facebook and we do it live on YouTube, and occasionally we'll do it live on Spreaker too. So so we do it um, uh, that way. We probably get maybe 25, 30 people watching it live. Um, which and we get 
feedback from that audience while we're doing the show live and we can answer their questions. We can address their concerns or their comments in the comment threads. And it, it adds to the, the depth of the program. And not everybody feels comfortable doing live because it, it does require you to um, uh, accept the fact that if you make a mistake, you know, it's out there. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's hard to to go in and edit it uh, live, though you can do that on Spreaker if you want to. You just basically get a copy of it and you edit it and then you just replace the audio file. So okay. you could conceivably do this little hybrid model. And I've been talking to the Spreaker team for a while about um, giving the creator the opportunity before. So let's say you start doing a live show and it goes up live and somebody can listen to it live and maybe it has mistakes in it, but before it gets published into the podcast feed, you're given some time where you can pop it out of there, edit it and upload it uh, again and then publish it um, w with some edits made. Uh, currently how the system works is that you do it live and it automatically gets posted to your RSS feed. You don't really get the opportunity to make any edits to it before it goes live. Um, so it goes live as a podcast, I should say. Um, so have, having that ability to kind of put the brakes on before it goes into your RSS feed and do some editing on it and then push it into your RSS feed when you're ready, I think is kind of a feature that I'd like to see in the platform. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it seems like it's one of the, the few platforms that actually is conscious of the fact that you do have an audience that, that is recording live and you're always looking for ways to make the interface easier for them to use, easier for them to engage, because one of the aspects of live is being able to interact with uh, folks who might be calling in or, or maybe different ways of interacting. You know, people could be tweeting in and maybe you'd have a, a, a yeah. tweet like... Uh, pop out or something like that that live twitter that's capturing the hashtags and then emails and just sort of like i have a a central console to so that any way you can decide to reach out that you know the speaker platform could pull it in at the same time yeah so our our software our our speaker studio for desktop and for mobile basically supports in the in the same software client um it has a a chat area that um listeners can go to the speaker website and type in comments in a chat area, and that will actually show up in the in the console of the recording and live streaming software that Spreaker provides for free in the App Store. Um, so, okay. so in and it also has touch points in the software that you can activate sound effects, um, intros and exits, things like that into your program. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also play tracks, playlists, and things like that. So, I mean, it, it's a it's a system that's capable of working with music too, but it's, um, but it's very powerful in being able to pipe in Skype recordings. Like I'm, I'm currently recording this in the, the speaker studio for desktop software over Skype. So keeping a backup copy. So, um, that, that's what the capability of the software and the best thing is that it's free and you don't even have to have a, a paid speaker account to use it. Actually mm. the CNN folks, uh, use the software for all all their remote uh, remote recordings that they do. Um, that that's not a that's not a bad uh, t testimonial <laughs> right there. Yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> it's a it's easy to use, and the best best of all, it's got the best price in the world. It's free. Yeah. So I was thinking as you we were talking about the expansion to other countries that Spreaker is probably well positioned. You know, being a European company to. Uh, take advantage of that and, and and think about how to market to these uh, to people in other countries who want to podcast but also with all these conferences i imagine you they you probably also have to increase your your marketing budget to start appearing and setting up booths at these places as well yeah i mean the staff uh in in europe uh you know travels around to europe and you know europe's pretty small so it's it's not um it's not a difficult traveling scenario for, for them so costs are relatively low um but you know most of the energy is put into events here in the u.s because that's that's there's just an explosion i don't know if you've noticed harry but there's just an explosion of podcasting events <laughs> happening all over the country right now uh yeah. It's almost getting to the point that there's no way I can keep up with it anymore. I, mean, it's, <laughs> I was trying to yeah, go, to, yeah, I was trying to go, go to most of them and be supportive of all these events, and I just it's I'm I'm overwhelmed now. 
So yeah. I can't. Well, yeah, because you're you're the you're the U.S. guy, so <laughs> I think yeah. you know, it's expect they're the one they're looking to you. Yeah, I'd be on the road every week going going, going to a new podcasting conference somewhere in the country. So I mean, I'm just look, I'm just looking at the end of this year. There's podcast Mid Atlantic in Philadelphia in September. Um, there's LA Podfest here in Los Angeles, which is more comedy. Uh, there's the PodCon Seattle, which yeah. is going to be in December. Yeah. And obviously there's podcast movement at the end of this month. Yeah. And there's more to that list than that. So yeah. there's <laughs> been, yeah, and those are the major ones. Yeah, exactly. There, the, there's all sorts of ones happening, smaller ones, regional events. I just heard about an event that's going on down in Australia that, they're, I'm trying to get pulled into now. It's happening in September. It's like, okay, come oh, on. Because <laughs> yeah. I know there's one in, Bri- in Brisbane called We Are Podcast and a lot of... Um, yeah, is that in... Uh, in space. Oh, is that not in September? I thought, thought that was in September, but... Yeah, yeah it's no. November 2nd to 4th. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay. Came, came yeah. off a month or I've two then. Them. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I know Jordan Harbinger is going to be there, John Lee Dumas. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I, I saw it. I got an email about uh, that event today, and I also got got an email about the 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 Mid Atlantic Podcast Conference. You know, Joe's putting yeah. that on again back in back in Philadelphia, which I guess is where Podcast Movement's going to be next year is in Philadelphia. So yeah, um, yeah. So just a lot of stuff going on in the space right now. I mean, I just got back from a radio conference. I don't know if you saw it. Um, it's called the Conclave. It was back in Minneapolis. Okay. It was actually a radio conference, not a podcasting conference. So I've been spending time working with the radio folks too, trying to get them, you know, on on board with um, trying to do the right thing with podcasting. It's it's definitely a challenge, but I I, I enjoy go, going to those events because uh, the radio folks are very much focused on audio, right? Which is definitely in the same wheelhouse. Um, but they, mm-hmm. they, they definitely look at everything as radio and I'm trying to get them to look at audio as more digital, um, and radio is just one way for them to distribute their content. And it's a little bit of a, yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge. They think that they've got the bull by the horns right now. They've got, you know, <laughs> the research is showing that, that they've got 93% of the listeners ears in the U S, uh, which is, I guess it's true. Um, but but when you, you know, think when about I, the quality of the of that of that ear that they have, like every once in a while, I jump into like a Lyft or a, 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 not Uber, but I only take Lyft, and it's and occasionally the the driver will have the radio station on, and it's if they're counting those people as a captive audience who just don't know any better, I don't know that the quality of the audience that's listening um, is something to brag about because I mean you only have to listen for like ten to fifteen minutes to realize why we don't listen to radio anymore. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I know. I don't. I try and avoid uh, radio too. Is my you know. I just don't. I think the uh, the the real question is going to be what, what's what's going to happen to the music stations, the music ra- radio stations. I I think they're in trouble too. I, and you look at Spotify and you look at digital properties. Um, you know what's happening in the car uh, is like a, a you know I think an analogy boiling frogs is is a great analogy yeah. for what's happening to totally. to radio in the car um slowly but surely each car that's sold that has carplay and android auto in it is uh taking one notch out of radio's future you know so it's uh and, and they're in a little bit of denial about that right now so we talked about the conferences so that's uh, another nice segue into what's coming up for us is podcast movement and um which is now becoming the the biggest podcast conference in the world i would think at this point they're expecting yeah. 2000 attendees if i'm not mistaken yeah i think it is clearly the the biggest i can't think of any other conference that's uh, anywhere near that has that kind of focus Though I do need to say that the NAB is really going all in um, on supporting podcasts. This coming year, they're going to have a pavilion at the National Association of Broadcasters Conference. Uh, so it'll be interesting in this next year, two years, um, what the NAB can can do in this, this space. Though it's it's going to be difficult for them to replace an, like uh, like podcast movement that's so focused on the podcast space and it has done such a terrific job of kind of integrating lots of the, the, um, separated communities that are in this, this medium, 
um, and pulling them in. I think Dan Franks has done uh, an outstanding job of um, being that that outreach to all of the different um, separate communities in the podcast market today. Um, yeah, Dan, Dan was on episode yeah. uh, one one thirty four. We had a great finally got to get him on after all these years and talk about uh, you know how he started the the conference and and some of the challenges he's going to have going forward growing it. Yeah, and and I think that the uh, I would say that the biggest um, uh, as I look forward to is what the NAB could bring to this medium. Um, it, I've been really really involved in that whole process. I, I I think the last two years I've done two or three panels um, at at the NAB about podcasting, mm -hmm. and it, it it's just one of those projects that I've I've just really focused on to get that that group and that, um, huge organization to get behind podcasting and really start educating the, the major media folks too, but also to, to embrace the independent podcasters too, and the, the independent market. Um, and we'll see, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how that's all going to play out, um, how much the podcast community will embrace NAB. So it's just such a huge event. I don't know if you've ever been to the NAB, Harry, have you Well, we went to, to remember, that remember two years ago, the NMX was next to the NAB. Oh, that's had, right. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, yeah. So that was the last last year of NMX, and I was there. Yeah, and it was that's just this little corner we had <laughs> with um, NMX, and and then we got to see the NAB floor, and it was just overwhelming. I mean, just yeah, it was obviously not a lot of focus on podcasting there, but I think because NMX is uh, non-existent now, it, it seems like a good opportunity to be that bridge because I imagine there's a lot of radio folks going to NAB. So it's interesting because it, it seems like they'll build out a whole awareness of podcasting and, and maybe they'll you know, bring new people into the space and, and they'll, they'll carve out a niche because I think there, there is space for different conferences to sort of you know, be, become focused on, on a certain um, segment of, of the podcasting as, as it grows. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's going to be a real focus there. I mean, I've been really surprised. I mean, I, th I think what we're going to see is quite a few people from the NAB going to podcast movement this year. Um, that's mm -hmm. how much of a focus they, they, they have on, um, trying to add that component to their, their coming, you know, coming events. I mean, they, they, they also have shows in New York, and in Las Vegas, um, so okay. so it, it could be interesting. So I mean, I know and that, that and that's um, Todd Cochran and I and R Rob Walsh are working with it, working with NAB right now to try and pull that together. That's good. So that's April, right? Twenty eighteen. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So you're you're going to be on a couple of panels. Do you want to give us a a, a a preview of some of the topics you're going to be covering at Podcast Movement? Yeah, actually, I'm I'm going to be moderating two sessions uh one that i do pretty much every year um is the state of podcasting 2017 um so i'm going to have R R rob walsh todd cochran um myself um tom webster from from edison and yeah. minion fogarty is going to be on that session oh, yeah. um as well so so we'll have actually uh, i think four out of the five uh participants on, on stage are 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 from the podcast hall of fame <laughs> so it's and gonna be four, and four out of the five have been on podcast junkies yeah have they now okay <laughs> so yeah uh, minyan was on rob yourself um and tom 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 you tom's been got, on tom's been oh on. he has okay but yeah and but i haven't had uh todd on because of his uh saturday only <laughs> interview schedule so that's been harder to schedule but oh, we'll, we'll get him on soon enough yeah yeah All okay right. Yeah, yeah, he he's pretty he's pretty rigid about that. I'm I'm a little surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm so that's, that's I'm much that's, more flexible. That's one panel. Yeah, I'm I'm much more flexible on that side. Um, and then the panel is going to be talking about geolocal podcasts. So I have kind of a special interest in that side, and that comes from kind of my focus on too, too. Um, is the growth and potential success. I I think it's coming for geolocal focused uh, podcasts, um, ones that are created in a local city, uh, focused on that local city, but maybe have a, a national topic. Um, and I think it's, it, it's one of those areas that is really kind of hopefully going to be helpful to radio. Um, but, but it's also kind of looking at 
local markets from a digital first perspective. Um, so, so there's going to be a session on there. I'm going to have, um, Seth, our, our wrestler, uh, from Jake media. That's going to be on that panel. Plus I have a fellow who's, um, the CEO of a, a mobile app company, uh, called Satchel. Who's going to be on the panel, Bo York. He's going to be on there. Oh yeah, too. I've met Bo. He's a nice guy. Yeah, really nice guy. So he's going to be on that session talking about because his mobile app uh, basically allows you to listen to local podcasts. So it's geolocal based, and when it pulls mm-hmm. up, so the app knows that you're like in Seattle or New York or whatever, and it'll pull up all the podcasts that are sourced out of New York or Seattle. Um, so he's very much drilled into this future of being able to correlate location to content. Uh, in the podcasting space. And, and I think that the combination of, of him, me, Seth, who comes from the radio side and, um, and, and Bo will be, uh, will create a terrific panel talking about this topic. Yeah. I met Bo at uh, PodFest, and I met, actually met, originally met him at LA PodFest. Uh-huh. Um, obviously we're starting to get, we're running out of, uh, names to call conferences at this point <laughs> so they, they start to get a little bit confusing well and now but, the, um, there's the podcast conferences coming back again uh pot summit up in canada too so i don't know okay. if you heard about that one yeah yeah i was up at that no, one when's, too. That, when's that one uh, when's that uh one? i believe that one's coming back uh i think um next year or sometime i'm not sure exactly what the date it was up in calgary this past year and i I went up to that. I think he's going to hold it in um, Vancouver. I think this coming year, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But Canada's and it's and it's called and it's called Podfest. No, it's called Pod Summit. Oh, Pod Summit. Okay. <laughs> if Man, you go to you Pod, right. it is hard. It is so hard to keep up. Yeah. I know uh, our, our friend, our mutual friend Addy Salcedo, had um, a podcast directory. I got to see if she's still maintaining it. But I, at some point, it must be getting harder <laughs> and harder oh, yeah, to keep yeah. up with everything. Oh yeah. Well, in the whole calendar, I know that if you go to pod to pod.com, they're, they're trying to keep track yeah. of all, all the event, um, activities that are going on in this medium and it's getting pretty long. All right. So yeah, when I was talking to Bo about Satchel, I really, really, you know, wanted to support him, but since I'm so married to overcast, the first question I had for him, I said, can you, can you import my podcast? Because the thought of me going back into Satchel and, and, adding, you know, 40 or 50 of my shows in there would just be like, it's such a, um, like a game stopper for me that just sounds like, oh man, I don't, I don't see myself doing that. So I, I wonder if at some point with the podcasters, there's going to be some sort of universal, like, um, export format that everyone could agree upon. Not, not that they need to have any other format battles in the podcasting space, but you know how, <laughs> how with, you know, with, uh, with a spreadsheet, you can just output a CSV and any spreadsheet program will, will upload it. So I'm, I'm wondering if something of, uh, like that would make it easier um, for people to, to move from one app to another. It's not in their best interests, but uh, I know he's going to have a challenge with that. Well, back in the back in the earlier days of this medium, uh, Dave Weiner, who was the inventor of RSS, he came up with another standard called um, OPML. So I don't know if... Uh, oh, yeah. You know if you that. if you remember that, it's basically it's the same uh, concept as an RSS feed, where you have like a list of episodes, but an OPML feed is a, a list of podcasts. So it would just be a list of RSS feeds um, that you could export and then import. So if we yeah. got this this OPML sharing standard in place, the problem is is it gets back to cutting and pasting um, URLs again, which is that's that's a yeah. problem. That, it needs to be something that's shared app to app. It needs to be some protocol that you click this button and it will send it over to something else somewhere, you know? So I'm not sure what it would take to make that happen, but there, I agree with you hundred percent. There should be some way that you can export and then re-import easily without having to get, yeah. you know, too geeky. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, is there, uh, so that's the two, I think you said, is there one more panel you're on? Uh, yeah, I'm on a two-part panel with uh, Rocky Thompson. Um, it's not a panel. It's actually it's a it's a tutorial training session that's happening. There's two parts, two different days on dynamic ad insertion. So mm. uh, Rocky Thomas is uh, a VP from AdsWiz, 
and they've they built a they have a dynamic ad insertion platform that they work with and Spreaker is also going to have a dynamic ad insertion platform that's going to be um, up and running here operational in um, probably by the end of this month or so where we're going to going to enable um, dynamic um, stitching or ad insertion into downloads um, in pre-roll positions um, in in content because currently today we don't support dynamic ad insertion into downloads uh, so that's the that, that's a big feature that we're adding so I'm going to be doing this session with Rocky um, about kind of the technology of a dynamic ad insertion and it's a two part series is what it is interesting yeah there's so many cool things happening in the space and I think everyone's just waiting to see how these play out and how the the everyday podcaster can leverage them because the idea of using a dynamic ad insertion is really appealing, but only if there's some ability to control, you know, what type of ad it is, if we can still do a, um, a host red ad and then dynamically insert that because I think yeah. it's, it's pretty jar jarring sometimes when you listen to some that just allow insertion of any ad um, and it totally breaks up the flow. So I think um, the... The ability to have more and more control over that as the as that part of the industry grows is going to be interesting. Yeah, I agree. I I think the whole dynamic ad insertion thing is a little bit of a a little bit of a red herring to some degree because uh, it's not going to be for everybody, and it needs to be done in a very specific way for it to be effective, and not like you said, jarring for listeners. Um, I agree. There's things that you can do around host reads with dynamic ad insertion too. You have to pre-record your host reads and then they can be dynamically inserted, but you also have to factor in dynamic ad insertion may not be a good thing for a lot of shows unless you're trying to monetize your archives. Um, and a lot of shows don't really have a lot of downloads of their archives. So you kind of have to weigh that with the costs of dynamic ad insertion too. So, um, and also the dynamic insertion stuff is good for targeting. So let's say you have an advertiser that you're trying to target to a specific region in the country. So let's say it's an advertiser like Home Depot that wants to run a ad campaign, uh, a paint sale in, let's say, yeah. the southeast. They can target all of the major cities in the southeast because they have stores that are running a, a you know, a sale on paint. Um, you can target that. Um, through dynamic ad insertion to only deliver those ads to those cities and those markets based on source IPs. So people people requesting those media files from that part of the country, you can identify it through the servers. Um, so that's that's where the technology has its sweet spot, and it's not going to be good for everybody. Um, I mean, a lot of advertisers don't really care about targeting. They don't really – but what they do care about is – getting scale right so if if you can get a much bigger scale of listeners based on replacing all the ads in your ar archives then then that puts you in a better position to sell you know instead of selling you know 10,000 downloads you're selling 20,000 downloads which means more revenue for you right yeah that I'm, I'm gonna check that one out because a lot of times uh, you start going to the same conference enough then probably 50 60 percent of them is stuff that you've covered already and for me it's it's really more of a family reunion <laughs> and i just in yeah. the hallways uh, yeah, trying to catch up with everyone that i haven't seen since last year yeah um, and the time goes by so quickly that i'm really really selective now about which sessions i pop into but it, i'm glad to see that they're they're maturing and they're reflecting the fact that the industry is growing and there's different challenges and there's now you know probably you know intermediate to advanced uh topics that a beginner wouldn't be interested in but folks who've been doing it for three or four years or even longer you know would would definitely be uh, attracted to mm -hmm. yeah i think that there's definitely a spectrum i mean there's probably going to be half of the attendees at this conference that are that probably haven't even started a podcast but they want to you know i, I yeah. that's what i've been seeing happening at a lot of these conferences is that half the people that attend these things are newbie podcasters they they don't know anything i mean it's it's really um taking me back to very early days in the space of educating yeah. people about how to podcast and i think that that's why a lot of these uh podcasts about podcasting are doing well right now is because there's just so many new people interested in the medium now yeah i thought there were you know i i thought i was like one of the last ones into the game when i came on board with the podcast about <laughs> podcasters <laughs> and then you know just 
sure enough, you know, a couple a year or two later, I start to see four or five different new shows come up, and it's you know, it's essentially the topic. You know, they're either doing a review show, yep. or you know, they're they're just talking about podcasts in general. And you know, more power to them because I think um, you know it's a good way for them to get into into the space. And I think the more people that are talking about podcasting help with this this discoverability and help people yeah. find new shows. Yeah, I mean, it's all about growing the the scale of listeners. I you know, as the more, yeah. more content is created, we got to have equal amount of listeners come into the medium that are that are new to consume it. All people will stop producing these you know all this great content. So we have to yeah. keep the the flood of listeners coming in the door. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, Rob, I, I want to thank you for coming back on. It was I think the timing couldn't have been more perfect, um, given that it's been two years and given that uh, there's so much new stuff happening that we got to chat about, and the fact that podcast movement is around the corner. So I think it worked out well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Harry, for having me on, and and thank you for. Um, doing what you do in the podcasting space to to spread all of the great great word and i love your t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> thanks rob uh what's the what's the best pl- place for folks to track you down online um well i do two two shows i do the speaker live show and j- just go to speaker live show.com and i do that every wednesday live talking about podcasting as well it's, it's more of a nuts and bolts show um, I don't really talk to other podcasters per se, but it's just talking about best practices. And I also do the new media yeah. show with Todd Cochran from Blueberry at uh, yep. newmediashow.com. And then also I can be reached in email, uh, rob at spreaker.com. And then I also have a Twitter account. It's a great place to follow me too. I post a lot of stuff about podcasting on my Twitter account uh, and just at Rob Greenlee. And that's with two E's on the end. Well, thanks again for being generous with your time, and I look forward to catching up with you at Podcast Movement. All right. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, I look forward to it, too. So thanks again to Rob for making a return visit to Podcast Junkies. It's really interesting because there's so many people in this space covering so many different angles, and it's so hard to keep on top of it. And I think I may do more of this down the line where I just talk to people who are leaders in this space, veterans in this space, and just get their take. So they help dilute it. And and it's nice when I can have it in the form of a conversation, because then I can give my thoughts and we can talk through uh, where we think this is headed. Regardless of what you think, it is definitely an exciting time to be podcasting. And there's so many interesting things happening and that have, have happened for me just in the past three years that I've been podcasting, I cannot wait to see what's going to happen from a content perspective. We're getting amazing things from a technology perspective. We're getting a lot of interesting things happening. So fun times to be watching, to be listening. We are a member of Podcastica intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Check out his fantastic collection of music, original and outstanding music at cedarsoil.com. Don't forget to support our sponsor, Podbean. Head on over to podbean.com slash podcast junkies to sign up. And I'll reiterate an earlier offer that if you use Podbean to set up your podcast, then definitely let me know and I'll get on the phone with you for about half an hour and we can chat all things podcast setup related. Tune in next week to hear my conversation with Quessy Hankins, otherwise known as Pod Wabbit. He is a super fan of the show. We connected because he was at a meetup, a local meetup in Las Vegas that's run by um, also previous guests, Chris Cerrone and Lacey Ursioli. And uh, Quessy was a, a, an attendee there and he heard about the show and he dove in head first. So he's been uh, engaged, highly engaged on all the social media and a lot of the things that I do online. And then I felt it just made sense to see what he was doing and I was not disappointed He's got an amazing network and all around real podcast junkie. He definitely earned his cred, so check that one out. If you made it this far, then you're no doubt listening for the retention hashtag. I'll tell you that in a second. (laughs) First, uh, if you haven't downloaded the PDF, um, eight tools to skyrocket your podcast launch, head on over over to podcastjunkies.com slash eight tools. And that's eight, the number eight tools, and uh, you'll be added to the list. And more importantly, get the PDF in your hands right away. So that hashtag, it's SpreakerRob, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R-R-O-B, hashtag SpreakerRob. And you can tag Rob at, uh, at Rob Greenlee, one word, 
R-O-B-G-R-E-E-N-L-E-E, and of course us at podcast underscore junkies. As you can tell, I've got podcasting on my mind nonstop because of the conference coming up. Good news, the t-shirts have been ordered, and I can't wait to pick them up on Friday. Uh, So by the time you're listening to this, uh, they should be in my hands, but if not, I'll post something on social media when I pick them up. And if you are going to Podcast Movement, pick up your tickets at podcastjunkies.com slash podcastmovement if you have not already to get the biggest discount available, 15% off. And if you are going, please look me up. You're not going to miss me. I'm the guy in the yellow shirt. Have a great day.